Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandian. We began a series yesterday talking about the carnal Christian, and we're taking a look at the communion table. Yesterday, we talked about Peter being a carnal Christian. Today, we're going to take a look at Judas being an unbeliever. And we're going to talk about the difference between the two and understand what God's plan is for your life. Let's go to the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandian. Again, welcome to Student of the Word. Glad that you're here today. We began a series yesterday, it's a two-day series, out of uh, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse uh, 23. And there we started talking about the communion elements and the power of communion in our life. Communion is not really just so much a celebration of salvation. It is a celebration of entrance into a life of discipleship. And uh, there's two people commanded not to drink and eat of the cup and eat of the bread. And that is a sinner and a carnal Christian. And so we're taking those two because we're talking about the difference between the two. A sinner cannot partake of communion at all. They should not even uh, be in that part of the service if they've never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. A, a carnal Christian is not supposed to take of it unless he repents confesses his sins. And that's why it says that in those verses back there, that uh, if you repent, if you turn back to God, everything, then you can partake of the communion elements. But if you're not, don't. Because if you do partake of communion as a carnal Christian, you bring back judgment on yourself. In other words, it says, if you don't deserve the Lord's body, don't discern the Lord's body correctly, then you can end up getting sick and weak and actually die early. And so, yes, you're still a Christian. Yes, you'll go to heaven, but you could have lived longer in this earth if you'd have discerned what the table was all about. Again, the table is not just a celebration of being born again. It's a celebration of an entrance into a greater life of discipleship. That's why it's called the Lord's table, not the Savior's table. It is the Lord's table because only believers can partake of it. And the beauty of communion is this. You can keep on partaking of it for the rest of your life here on this earth. Jesus didn't say how often to partake of it. He just said, as often as you do, do it in remembrance of me. It was said of Smith Wigglesworth. He carried a small communion element uh, uh, with himself and he took it every day. He would have a small cup and a small piece of bread and he carried this in his luggage wherever he went. And that's what he partook of every day, had communion with the Lord every morning. There's churches that do it every single week. There's churches that do it once a month. It simply comes back to it again. Jesus said, as often as you do it, then do it in remembrance of me. And so again, the one that can't partake is the sinner. The one that that is told not to take until he gets right with God is the carnal Christian. And we're bringing that out because it's interesting what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning there in those verses where he said, the same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He simply points out when this was introduced, there was somebody there that was not a believer. And that one that was not a believer was Judas. Judas never accepted the Lord. He was a devil from the beginning. He simply operated around the disciples and he passed himself off as a Christian when he was not a Christian. He's much like the one that's going to stand before the Lord one day and say, well, didn't I cast out devils in your name? Didn't I do many wonderful works in your name? And the Lord's going to say, no, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Now, people again jump into that and say, well, how in the world could a sinner cast out devils? In the name? It didn't say he did. The person said they did. But here's the point. They fell back on their works. Didn't we cast out devils? Didn't we prophesy? Didn't we do all these things in your name? And he'll say, that doesn't matter. You never said to me, Lord, didn't we open up our heart, receive you as our savior, receive you as our Lord? If that would have been the case, they would have had an argument. They had no argument. They fell back on their works. I don't care how spiritual your works look. I don't care how much money you give to the church. I don't care how often you attend. None of that makes you a believer. None of those things make you a child of God. You have to open up your heart. That's why, again, the communion table is not called the Savior's table. It's called the Lord's table. Once you've received Jesus as Lord and Savior, now you can receive of communion. But hold on. If you're carnal at that moment, get rid of the carnality. Confess your sins. And once you do, then partake of the communion elements. Well, so what the Lord is saying is, if you want the full benefits of the communion table, be born again and be walking with the Lord 
as a believer. Let's go back to what, what uh, Paul was saying, that the same night Jesus was betrayed, he introduced this. And the one that betrayed him had to be gone from the room when communion was offered, and that's exactly what happened. There came a time here where Judas literally ran from the room after that is when Jesus introduced the communion. And then uh, we find the time too when, when, uh, when Jesus had to straighten out the disciples too, because why? Some of them were carnal at the time, including Peter, and uh, had, they had to get themselves right before him. He's simply saying, I'm offering this to you. This is the thing of discipleship. And But unless you're in fellowship with me, you really should not be partaking of this. So let's go back there. John chapter 13, we'll begin in verse 21. We're gonna go through verse 30. I'm offering uh, on this broadcast, my series on understanding the carnal Christian. And the things I'm getting to here, I go into much greater depth on that series. And I know it's gonna be a great blessing for you. Please get that for yourself grow in those things and under, because I'll tell you what, there's nothing more comforting than understanding when you see some people, why they act like they do, even though they're saved, they're under the control of the flesh. John chapter 13, we're gonna read from verse 21 down through verse 30. It says, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in his spirit and testified saying, I most assuredly say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at each other, perplexed of whom he spoke, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. This was John. Simon Peter, motioning to him, asked who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he whom I will give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered to him. Notice this, he's the only one the Bible ever says is, is Satan possessed. You can be demon possessed. Uh, sinners can be demon possessed. Christians can be demon oppressed, but only uh, Judas is the one that actually Satan himself entered into him. Then Jesus said to him, whatever you do, do it quickly. But no one at this table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, since Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately. And so he took a piece of bread, but he didn't partake with the disciples, just ran out the door. He looked like he started to and then could not partake of the communion after that. He ran out immediately. Immediately. I want you to notice something right here. When people say that Jesus was poor, his disciples were poor, they gave to the poor so often that whenever Judas left the room, they thought, oh, he's going to give money. It was something they did all the time. And so to say that Jesus was poor, poor people don't give money to the poor. I'm not saying that Jesus was mega wealthy and he owned huge estates and things like that. No, he was just a very a personally wealthy man who among society was known. He had money. He took care of 12 disciples. He wore nice clothing. The disciples left uh, lucrative positions and jobs in this world. And Jesus picked up with that as they followed him. So again, they were so often giving to the poor that the disciples thought that's really what happened. He ran to give money to the poor, but he didn't. He was stealing the money bag. He was going out of there. So Judas was a sinner and he rejected Jesus. Let's talk about him for just a moment. Judas was one of those that Jesus talked about, a wolf in sheep's clothing. His nature had not changed. He was still a wolf on the outside, but he had the appearance of a Christian on the outside and was confronted and fled the room at the end of the meal before the disciples took communion. We're talking about this. There's other passages of scripture to discuss this. First John chapter two and verse 19 talk about that even today we have Judas Iscariots that come to church. It's Satan's person being used in the church to try to win people over, get them to separate from the church. And this was what eventually Judas wanted to do was separate the disciples. But in first John chapter two, and verse 19, it says this, they went out from us, but were never a part of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out so they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Jesus took communion with the remaining 11. Judas could not receive communion. Why? Because he was not saved. If Paul said Jesus took the first communion with his disciples, then Judas could not have been present for it because Judas was not a real disciple. He was simply a follower of Jesus. Let me tell you something about the Christian way of life. Because you're a follower of Jesus doesn't make you a Christian. If you're a follower of Buddha, it makes you a Buddhist. If you're a follower of Muhammad, then you become a Muslim. And if you're a follower of somebody else, you might be some other religion, but you know what? Just to follow Jesus doesn't make you a Christian. 
Christianity is a miracle, then you become a follower of Jesus. So we have here that he was just following Jesus, which again, doesn't make you a disciple, but it makes you look like one of them. Does it make you a Christian? You look like one of them. And it wasn't until Jesus revealed the very heart of Judas that he ran out of the room and then went to betray the Lord for money. Again, the love of money is the root of all evil. If Satan was inside of him at that time, he went after exactly what Satan went for. That was the love of money. This is why Satan rebelled against God. This is why, again, that uh, whenever Lucifer became Satan, it's because he rebelled against God and the multitude of his merchandise filled him with violence. And that's why he took the power of money and decided with that power, which is a fake power, a false power, a secondary power to the things of God, tried to overthrow God. And of course, God overthrew him, cast him out of heaven. We still have those today that still try to follow the money trail. And if you listen, if you follow the money trail, you can usually find out the core of things because it is the root of all evil. If Paul said Jesus took the first communion with his disciples, again, Judas could not have been present for us. So let's talk about it. What about Peter? We've talked about Judas. Let's talk about Peter. Matthew chapter 26, verse 31 through 35 says this. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. He's talking about the Lord here. God is going to strike him because Jesus will allow it to be done. Jesus said, I lay my life down when I want to. He said, I pick it up when I want to. But on the cross, he opened himself up, took on the sin of all mankind and allowed God the Father to strike him on the cross. And he became sin for us, died for sin, rose from the dead. And the same God that struck him with all the sins of the world now caused him to be raised from the dead. He says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, assuredly, I'd say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. They all jumped in emphatically. And here's the point, all of them deserted Jesus. Only eventually John came back when Jesus was on the cross, the only one of the 12 that did that. All the rest of them ran off and Peter ran off and denied Jesus in front of a little girl. Well, we come back to it again. Peter was a believer, yes, but he was a carnal Christian. And this is where we get the difference between a sinner and a carnal Christian, between a Judas and a Peter. We'll see you right after the break. What is it that makes a Christian a carnal Christian? A carnal Christian is simply a Christian who is caught up in sinning. This series by Pastor Bob Yandin will help you identify the differences between carnality and spirituality and make any corrections needed to avoid carnality. The story of David's sin with Bathsheba and the results of that sin perfectly exemplify what happens when a believer chooses to walk in carnality. But thankfully, you will also learn about the process of complete forgiveness and restoration that results from repentance. This eight lesson series is a must for everyone desiring to avoid the pitfalls of carnality to walk in maturity and holiness in Christ Jesus. To order Understanding the Carnal Christian, go to bobbyendian.com. Theology Simplified is a practical guide to foundational biblical truth. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. They often become disguised as complicated or deep-sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Using straightforward vocabulary and down-to-earth examples, Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. Eight crucial doctrines of the Christian faith are demystified, redemption, justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, election, propitiation, and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, come to light as you read and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, 
healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 26 and take a look at verses 31 through 35 again. Jesus said this to the 11 remaining disciples after that Judas had left the room. And he says to them in this verse of scripture, Jesus said to them, again, 11 disciples, all saved, all received Jesus. And again, Judas did not. He was that wolf in sheep's clothing. And so he ran away. And so the 11 that are left there, Jesus said, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. Notice this, he didn't say you've lost your salvation. He said, you're gonna stumble. As believers, you're going to fall down. You're going to stumble for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter answered and said, oh, it's like Peter just didn't even hear this thing out. He says, I'm gonna die but then I'm gonna be raised again from the dead and I will go before you to Galilee. I, I'm gonna come back in a resurrection body. The disciples just didn't hear that. Even when Jesus died, they thought he was dead. They were shocked when he was raised from the dead. Jesus told him he was gonna be raised from the dead. And here's what Peter said. Peter didn't even hear that part. All he heard about was the fact, you're all going to leave me. You're all going to stumble. And Peter answered and said to him, even if all were made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Listen, Jesus, I know these other guys and you do too. They're not quite up to par, but me, I'll be fine. Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Well, that sounds good. It sounds noble, but that's not exactly what happened. Peter denied the Lord in front of a little girl standing around a fire with a group of people around there. What was she gonna do, beat him up? He's a fisherman, strong guy. And she asked him a question. Are you one of his disciples? He said, no. She said, yeah, you are. I saw you. And he goes, no. She said, yes, you are. I know you are. And that's when he began to curse curse the Lord. And so then he saw Jesus. Jesus told him he would deny him three times. And after he did the third time, the rooster crowed. And Jesus heard it. Peter heard it. Now Peter breaks down crying. But here's the point. Jesus said, all of you will betray me. All of you will run off and, and, and be scattered. And that's exactly what happened. The other 10 all scattered and ran along with Peter who denied him. And when Jesus was taken and tried, the disciples weren't there. When he was placed on the cross, the disciples weren't there. When Jesus was on the cross, John came back and stood there and Jesus turned the keeping of his mother over to John. So we find John was the only one that came back. The other 10 all ran off of the 11 and then one, of course, Judas ran off and hanged himself that night because of what he had done to the Lord. Peter, on the other hand, later on took the communion after that, denied the Lord after that with anger and cursing, and Peter represents here a carnal believer. So in church, we may have a Judas attending who never accepts the Lord. We'll stand before him one day saying, didn't I cast out devils? Jesus will say, I never knew you. But people like Peter, yes, I do know you. But what happens is salvation is eternal, but our walk with Jesus and actually causes us to lose rewards. Going to heaven is a gift. But once we go to heaven, we will receive rewards for the things we've done on earth. Revelation 14, 13 says that when we die, our works do follow us. And that's our good works and our bad works. Now, if I've confessed my bad things down here on earth, the things I did wrong, my carnal things, I will never be held accountable for it in heaven. If we ask the Lord to forgive us, of those sins, we will not be judged for them. But if we don't, they will go to heaven too and we'll stand before the Lord. And the things we've done in the flesh are called wood, hay, and stubble. But the things that we've done in fellowship with God in righteousness are called gold, silver, and precious stones. Fire will descend and destroy the wood, hay, and stubble will be rewarded for what's left over. Some will have great things left over. Some will have a few things left over. Some will have nothing left over, but they will be saved, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as by fire they're going to be saved. And so again, there we talk about the judgment seat of Christ and what the Lord wants to do for us. 1 Corinthians chapter three gets even into further description of that. There in chapter 11 about the communion, but in 1 Corinthians chapter three, it talks about the fact we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So Peter was a carnal believer, but Judas was an unbeliever. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 27, verses three through five. Here we have here Judas, 
his betrayer, seeing he had been condemned, was remorseful. The Greek word here, metamelamai, means to regret what you have done. Metanoeo is the word for truly repenting. It means to change your mind. What happened was, is that when uh, Peter uh, confessed his sins, he really did change his whole way of thinking and he repented before the Lord. But this word metamelamai simply means to regret it and doesn't mean to truly repent. He was remorseful for what he did. He wished he would have done something different, but he really did not want to accept the Lord as his savior. And so it says here again, Judas, his betrayer, seeing he had been condemned and was remorseful or regretted and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Notice he didn't say that he is the Lord. He's the savior. I want to accept him as my savior. No, he simply said, I still don't want him. I have betrayed him and he's innocent of all the things you're trying to do to him, but he Dale still didn't seem as his Lord and Savior. And they said, what is this to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. So we have here again, Judas was an unbeliever. Judas came and threw all the money down, but that still doesn't save you. He tried to undo what he had done. Even if he could undo what he had done, he then still wouldn't get saved. Salvation would come if he fell on his knees and repented as a sinner and accepted Jesus as his savior and his Lord, then he would have been saved, but he didn't do that. And so it says he, uh, again, was an unbeliever. He hanged himself and went to hell. You say, well, this verse doesn't say he went to hell. Well, it does later. Acts chapter one and verse 25. Here, the disciples in the upper room we're talking to each other about uh, following Jesus. And it says in Acts one twenty five, it says that Judas to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. He was with us. He had a position with us, but he fell from his position. He never was saved, but he walked with the disciples, looked like the disciples, acted like the disciples, but was not a disciple because he was never a convert in the first place. So he went to his own place. This is the place where, again, he went. Judas was an unbeliever, and Peter, again, was a carnal Christian. John chapter 6 and verse 70 says this, Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the 12, and one of you is a devil? Notice, he didn't say used to be a devil. He said he is a devil. Even there, Jesus was pointing out one of the 12 is a devil, he has Satan living in him. He is of his father, the devil, as Jesus said to those, again, Pharisees that were trying to come against him. And he spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him being one of the 12. He was one of the 12 disciples, one of those 12 that followed Jesus. But again, remember, I said it earlier, to follow Jesus doesn't make you a Christian. You become a Christian, then you follow Jesus. To follow Buddha, you're a Buddhist. To follow Muhammad, then you're a Muslim. But to follow Jesus doesn't make you a Christian. And there's many sinners following Jesus today, even counting him as a great teacher, following some of his teachings, even quoting parts of the Bible, but they've never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Once you accept him, then to follow him is to become a disciple. A follower of Jesus is a description of a disciple, not of somebody who's trying to be saved. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through verse 23, Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. What is the will of God who's in heaven? Accept my Son as your Lord and Savior. He says, just because you say, Lord, Lord, doesn't mean you're gonna enter the kingdom of heaven. You can call me Lord and not mean that I am Lord. In other words, it has to be believed in the heart, then confess with the mouth, not just saying it with the mouth. Once you fully accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you can say it. So not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, this is when he stands on the earth and judges all the nations and separates them and, sep and puts the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left hand, and the sheep are believers, the goats are unbelievers. Again, all nations are brought before him. And he doesn't judge them because they're black, they're white, they're part of this nation or not. No, he brings the nations before him. They're judged for one thing. Did you accept me as Lord and Savior or not? Are you a sheep or are you a goat? 
When we finally come down to that last day, there's gonna come a day when even in heaven, they're gonna be standing before him. And there's one reason why they can't come into heaven. Their name is not found written in the book of life, period, over, out. It simply means there again from that verse of scripture, there's only one way to receive eternal life, receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Your name will be found forever in the Lamb's book of life. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonderful works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Again, this was a type of Judas Iscariot. Judas was one of those. Peter was a carnal believer. He sinned, then returned to the Lord and repented. Now this word is metanoeo. The other word metamelami means to just change your mind. It means to, you know, just to regret what you have done. But here we actually have a repentance. And this means to change the attitude and change your actions that accompany it. As said back in the Old Testament, he that uh, confesses his sins and then turns from them. And this is what Peter did. He sinned, he then repented, and he turned from it. But had Peter died in his carnality, he would have gone to heaven as a carnal believer. His sins and physical death would be handled at the judgment seat of Christ. Judas went to the place all sinners go. His sin of rejecting Jesus will one day be handled at the great white throne judgment. Taking the communion elements as a Christian with known sin in your life can lead to an early death. And that's why he said many sleep or many die early. Apparently, many continued in taking communion with known sin and they had already died. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 30, he said, many of them have already gone. Many of them have already perished. They have died. He's talking about that among the carnal group that was at Corinth, of which many were carnal, the most carnal church in the New Testament, many of them had died in the church. They look back on this and say, I don't understand. He was such a young person. How could he have died? He remained in carnality, kept partaking of communion, acting like those who were followers of Jesus, walking as if they were a disciple of the Lord and were not and were basically lying in front of the congregation, they were asleep among the dead. Carnal Christians, born again, Holy Spirit living in them, but not living by the power of the Holy Spirit, living by the power of the flesh, living in carnality. The Holy Spirit who lived in them had no control over them. They were controlled by their flesh and they died. Did they go to heaven? Yes. But in heaven, their sins will be then uh, before the Lord and their works will be taken before the Lord and the, the wood, hay and stubble burn up. Whatever they have left over of gold, silver and precious stones, they'll be rewarded for. It simply comes back to this. Are you a sinner? Accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Have you ever been born again? If the answer is no, accept him as Lord and Savior. Are you a Christian? Are you living by your flesh? Repent, get back in fellowship with God, start living for the Lord and find out what his power can do in your daily life. See you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.